Five the same. And then I watched uh, Korean baseball because um, I just needed a live sport fix. Really, uh, the baseball is pretty cool. They with the you know they do like the little fans or the cardboard cutouts. Makes it oddly real. Hmm. But they also said that some the Korean baseball that's being streamed right now, Saturday had two point five million people tune in. I think everyone's just. <laughs> All right, we're now recording, so we're all good to go. John, do we have everything, uh, you got, a, we got everything kind of ready to go for our town hall later? Yeah, I got, uh, I got it all queued up so I can, I can pass it your way. Cool. They call this the calm before the storm. Yeah. Max Kent looking good. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird you're not, not repping city gear, guy. Dude, it's all sweaty. I don't think. <laughs> like, and you know how I sweat. It's like, it's not just normal. Like, it looks like I got out of a pool. Got done with his fourth workout for the day and had to put on a button up. <sighs> okay. I appreciate that. I haven't worn a, a button up shirt in uh, since March 12th. <laughs> Adam Pribble, fun facts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole sex in my closet I haven't even like looked at it. Like, well, pretty much only city gear and then <laughs> sweatpants. Yeah, pretty much. All right. People are coming in just a couple minutes now before we get started. And, uh, for you know, even if people come in late, the nice thing is we are recording. So we'll send out the recording and we'll also be posting it online. Did I just see Jeremiah's name in here? Yeah, he's trying to get recruited. You probably see some uh, friendly, friendly names in the crowd. Okay. I think uh, I think we'll just go ahead and get started because we'll be we'll try to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so, once again, um, I'll just my name's Adam Pribble. I'm the general manager and technical director at uh, Minneapolis City Soccer Club, and uh, really want to thank everyone first and foremost for tuning in. Uh, this is kind of our first part in a webinar series. Um, this one's focusing on college recruiting in the COVID-19 era. So um, before we get started, I just want to run through just some uh, kind of operational pieces. You know, uh, everyone's already done a great job of it, but if uh, you're just tuning in, just make sure that you mute your uh, computer. And um, so only the people that are going to be presenting today will turn on their microphone. Um, and you don't have to necessarily have your video on either, though you certainly can if you'd like. Um, Throughout the presentation, you know, feel free if you have any questions, comments, whatever, uh, make, just put it in the chat function on, um, on the Zoom call. And so we'll, uh, some of our staff here are gonna be monitoring that, uh, mostly our, um, our sporting director, John Bisworm, and we'll be kind of answering those at the end in a Q&A. Uh, so we'll curate all those questions together and answer them. Um, and certainly you'll, you'll have opportunity at the end to type in those questions as well. 
So with that, um, you know, and lastly, I think I've mentioned it already, but I'll say it again that we are recording this and uh, we'll be posting it and sending it out accordingly. And let's go ahead and get started. So uh, just we're going to run over a brief agenda. I'm not going to read everything for here for tonight, um, it, but just some notes to go off of so you guys can kind of take a look at what we're going to be going through. There is a lot of information and we're going to try to cover it as quickly and in depth as we can. But we'll also, we're going to give you some of our contact information. So if you have questions on any of the information we go over, just simply reach out and you can always reach out through our website, which is www.minneapoliscitysc.com. So before we get into college recruiting, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just Minneapolis City Soccer Club and who we are and why we're doing this. So Minneapolis City Soccer Club um, is a high performance men's soccer club. It's an amateur club. We've been around since 2000, 2015, 2016. Um, and so we play in the fourth tier of the U.S. Pyramid. We play in what's called the NPSL, the National Premier Soccer League, the UPSL, and we're also been involved in the US Open Cup. Um, and so within that, you know, where do we fit in in that, in that pyramid? You know, with Minnesota United, for example, being in that first tier, we play, are in the fourth tier, if that helps gives any perspective. But we are very successful. We've fielded very uh, competitive teams and we, we're back-to-back -back NPSL North Conference champions. We are a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit. Um, and really, we've come around as a club to help bridge the gap, right? So, and what we mean there is that we saw a, a lot of really quality youth clubs in the area. Um, and then you kind of get to a certain age, um, or, and it's very difficult to find a really high quality place to play, whether you're going into college and want to stay sharp while you're in college or if you have post-college um, aspirations. So if you're trying to go professional or you just really want to play it at the highest level possible, um, there, is, there is some good outlets for that in the area, chiefly in the MASL and MRSL. And that's actually we were, where we were founded out of a very successful uh, MASL-based club called Stegmans. So they were very, uh, it, it was a group of guys that were really well organized and we're doing well in the MESL and decided to, you know, see if they can make this foray into a much more uh, competitive environment. And so far we've done really well with it. Um, and so taking that, that mission and that's kind of why we're here today, because unfortunately we're not able to play soccer. We would have had our last game or our first game this last weekend. Um, and so in the absence of soccer, I think all of us, at Minneapolis City, we're looking around and trying to see how we could affect uh, our local community and our local soccer community in a positive way. Um, and so one of the first things that came to our mind was that we have this uh, opportunity because we speak with a lot of college coaches about high level, high level players that are either in our system um, or would like to be in our system um, and, and about various recruiting techniques and and, and all of that. So if we felt like we were really well positioned to discuss it, as well as our best asset is we've got a phenomenal group of guys. So we've got a group of players here today that played in all different levels of uh, Division One, Two, II, and Three, um, and they've all kind of taken different paths, but they're extremely talented, um, well-rounded young men that are going to be able to speak really well about the college recruiting experience. And it just should be noted with Minneapolis City, you know, because there may be people on this uh, webinar that know Minneapolis City really well. There could be a good number that don't know Minneapolis City, but um, encourage you to check us out once we do get playing again, or check us out online or our social media. Um, but we're, we're a club that's a do-it-yourself club. It's a bunch of volunteer people that we're member driven so you can purchase memberships um, and we're just trying to make our local soccer community a little bit better. So just a couple introductions. Um, our technical staff that are speaking today, um, you guys have been hearing myself um, and I've been with the club since the beginning. 
Um, I started as a volunteer uh, goalkeeper coach. Um, I've been the head coach for a couple years, um, and now I'm, I'm an assistant coach and work um, in, with the uh, technical staff as in a director role, as well as a now general manager, so helping out in the front office. Um, we'll also be joined with John Bisworm. He's our recruiting director, sporting director, one of the founders of Minneapolis City. Uh, you may have heard his voice uh, doing um, color commentary for our games, as well as our podcast, The People's Pitch. But John's main role with the club um, and why large part why I've been so successful is uh, John scours the Twin Cities and anyone in Minnesota. So Minneapolis City Soccer Club is made up of all players that have some sort of connection to Minnesota. While they, whether they live here or are from here um, or away at college, whatever, you know, if you call Minneapolis or Minnesota your home, uh, you, you're eligible to play with our team. So John does a really good job at finding players and talent around the country that are that have Minnesota ties or are here and bringing them in to the club. Um, and then he's he's involved in every facet of the club as well. Um, I'm also going to introduce Matt Vandenskoten, our head coach. Matt took over uh, last year. He's been an assistant coach and head coach with the um, with our U23 team now Minneapolis City Two. Um, he, last year, he took over as the head coach of our uh, first team, the NPSL team, um, and had a very successful year. He's a youth coach um, and has been involved in every aspect of soccer from the top down as a college coach. Um, he, he coached in college for over five years in an assistant role and so has done the recruiting piece. So there's a wealth of experience here that we'll be able to kind of guide you through. And, and of course, uh, again, like I said, I think the, the main attraction is the players. So I'm going to, we'll actually hold off on more uh, specific inter introductions when they're going to speak later. But um, he, these are the five players that will be speaking in a little bit. So to get into the, uh, to jump right into our webinar tonight. Just want to talk a little bit about the Minnesota recruiting landscape. And I just want to make a note that Minneapolis City Soccer Club right now is, is only a men's program. Okay, so we have about 60 young men in our program, anywhere from ages 16, 17 to I think around 32, 33 um, right now. In the future, we might have a women's program as well, but we remember we started from that men's amateur soccer league in the Twin Cities. So, uh, but we wanted to really talk about the recruiting landscape in totality uh, for soccer in Minnesota, um, because that's what's most relevant here. So just to take a little snapshot of Minnesota, we have um, on the men's side, there's no current division one. 1D2 in St. Cloud, and then a bunch of really quality D3 schools, one, I, one NAI and five junior colleges. Uh, just to note, St. Thomas Academy, as many of you may, may well know, is applying to go Division I um, from Division Three. It's kind of an unprecedented move, but uh, St. Thomas being a large, large school in, in the D3 ranks has been very successful, um, and so they're looking to make that jump, but it's not confirmed yet. On the women's side, um, you can take a look. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities within Minnesota and um, for, on the men and women's side. The key being that in Minnesota, historically, with no Division I on the men's side, at, I think that that has made it somewhat difficult for uh, young men to be recruited traditionally. I do see that those that's starting to change uh, over time as Regionally, there's more schools that are seeing the Twin Cities as they're trying to get a footing here of a good recruiting base because we do have talent that's coming out. And that has, um, I think the opportunities have only grown over time. But I know that some of the guys and certainly John will be speaking to that later in the webinar. Um, I wanted to throw out a few statistics as well, just on, and, and these statistics I put in here, the percentages are taken directly from the NCAA website. But um, I was a athletic director at a local high school that 
had did very well in sports. So I oversaw a lot of, um, of those interactions with college coaches, high school coaches, high school players, their families, um, and also navigating obviously the national letter of intent. Um, nationally, only 5.6% of high school athletes, this is soccer, go on to play in college. Not in 1.3, it gets smaller and more difficult, obviously, when you're going to go D1. So I think that's really important for to understand the context that it's very difficult at any level to go on and play at, at college. Um, and that's why I think that high school is such a great, um, great vehicle for, uh, for, for enjoying sports. But just to understand that picture, it's very difficult to do. And, and part of the reason is, is how it all breaks down. So for division one, for example, you men are only have 9.9 .9 full scholarships and women are capped at 14. So when you're talking about a roster of 28 players, the 9.9 .9 scholarships, you've got to break that up a lot to kind of have it go around and get your a full value to get to round out your roster. That is to say that in soccer, it's not like your revenue generating sports in football and men's basketball, where you have more percentages of higher or, or full scholarships. So again, division one and division two are the only divisions that are able to give those scholarships technically for athletic and they have to split up. And so you're often going to time get a partial scholarship to play division one or division two soccer. Um, and again, so I mentioned that difference revenue generating sports. The difference here is that in America and the way that our university system is set up and, and kind of where we're at historically is that, again, men's basketball and football are the two revenue generating sports that typically um, fund a lot of um, school athletic departments. And so they get more scholarships and, and there's more money in those. Um, again, the reason I bring it up here is because I think that there's myths about recruiting that is created by, you know, whether you see it on media or on TV or whatever, um, where there's uh, people that are coming out and like knocking on doors and giving you full, full rides and this and that. And it's just not the case in soccer. Um, certainly if you're talented, they will find you. And I can't stress that enough. But at the same time, um, there's different ways, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about tonight is how to get noticed, how to market yourself, um, you know, and how to go out and start creating those connections with a, with a school and coaches so that you increase your chance at, you know, playing sports at the next level in college. So just a quick brief in the impact of COVID-19. Um, and again, a lot of this is taken directly from the NCAA. And, and if it's anything is updated in the last few days, um, you know, I, I fully admit that I put this together last week. So with COVID-19, obviously things change at the drop of a dime. Uh, but in-person recruiting is suspended through May 31st, as of now. Um, the National Letter of Intent signing period, and so that's a that's, you know, you sign your national letter of intent to a school if you're going to be um, in Division One or Division II. Um, but that, that period hasn't changed for soccer players. So it remains through mid-November mid through August 1st. Um, the, you know, the impact of COVID-19 right now is that email and really kind of reaching out and making connections in different, different ways that we'll be talking about is more important than ever. Um, because the main reason that we decided to do this webinar first is because we're all kind of facing the fact that we may not have competitive soccer this summer. Um, and with that goes, I mean, many tournaments have already been canceled, especially the national tournament showcases a lot of these high level events where college coaches are going to do a lot of recruiting. So with missing, potentially missing a recruiting cycle, that's where we really wanted to come in and see if we could help bridge the gap for people. Um, also summer camps are going to be affected. So summer ID camps are a great way once you've made connections with schools to go out, to go to their camp, you know, the coaching staff is going to be there. They can get a pretty good in-depth look at, look at you. 
And if that's affected this summer, um, then using video is going to be critical. But there's right ways and wrong ways to use video in highlight videos or full game tapes. And we're going to talk about that as well tonight. And then when is the right time to start? So I just wanted to, you know, as an athletic director at a high school, I gave this talk to high school classes at a time uh, quite often. And, and my, my advice is always the same, is that it's never too early to start. So the biggest thing as a freshman, you know, if you're a freshman or even an incoming freshman, it, it doesn't hurt to start making a list of schools that you might be interested in. Um, and, and so taking a look at, you know, if you want a big school or small school or where do you want to live, what, what do you want to study, those types of things. Certainly as a freshman, you don't have to have all the answers, but to start making a list um, and, and talking about it with your parents or guardians and starting to figure out what interests you, that's really important. Um, then as a sophomore, again, I think it's, you're taking a look at that list that you're making, you're starting to pare down what you think you could be interested in, get down to a list of anywhere from five to 10, and you can start making some outreach with email. Then once you get into, you know, sophomore, junior year, um, the, that's when you're recruiting period really ramps up so after your, the summer of your sophomore year through your junior year. Um, you're making a lot of connections with college coaches. You're starting to talk to individuals um, and you're starting to, again, narrow down that list and figure out how do I pare this list down to like five schools that, uh, that I could be interested in. And then your senior year is you're trying to figure it all out. So, I mean, that's kind of a, an over, overview of what is an ideal way to break it down. If you don't fit into there or like you feel like you're behind, it doesn't matter. It's just, then it's just, it's time to get started now, you know? And so the other piece that I wanted to just mention on here is that it, it used to be what we call the clearinghouse, uh, but now you have to get registered on the NCAA eligibility center. So if you just type that into Google, the NCAA eligibility center, but you have to create a login, um, and, and you want to get your ACT stuff sorted out into there because that's one of the first places that college coaches are going to look once you've made contact. They want to know that you're eligible um, and that you've got things buttoned up on that side. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to John. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Just want to make a quick comment. If you do have any questions, uh, you can go through the chat function, drop it in there, and then we will uh, get to those at the end. Um, if there's anything that uh, while we're talking makes uh, some sense to jot down a quick question, we'll, uh, we'll absolutely save some time to get to those. So when we talk about, you know, the landscape of recruiting, we want to obviously talk about what the traditional methods are, because at some point in time, we will get back to those. Uh, we spoke to 20 different college coaches that we've had players come through our program and uh, for this webinar and, and a lot of the, the recruiting methods, both uh, traditionally and, you know, during this, this pandemic um, align, you know, they, they're all in the same boat, just as the same as all the players are in the same boat, but a quick recap on, on how they traditionally recruit. Obviously they're watching matches, whether it's um, getting out to, um, high-level tournaments, state cup, uh, club tournaments, high school state tournaments, um, hosting their own identification camps, or going to those kind of state-by-state -state player showcases. And as Adam mentioned, video analysis, um, it, it will always be huge. Um, but obviously, as we, could, we can imagine right now, is, uh, it's even, even greater. They'll also go through a lot of due diligence on talking to your current club or high school coaches. So not just necessarily watching you on tape, but also asking some questions for the people that you play with, or excuse me, play for. Um, they'll also talk to current players that are on their roster. So if there's someone from your, your club system or potentially your high school or your general area, um, they will reach out to those players that, that they have in their program to ask if they know who you are um, and maybe if they had played with you at some point. And then they'll, they'll look at your, your soccer playing resume, something you definitely want to have um, created if you have not already created it, um, and have it up to date. And then they will do their reference checking. So if, if they haven't already talked to some of the similar players um, from their roster that, that 
might know who you are or even one of your coaches. Um, they'll reach out to the people that you put down there because they want to get a, a full idea of who you are as not only as a player, but also as, as a person. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. So how are things, things changing? Obviously, the traditional methods will continue uh, outside of obvious one-to-one -one connection points um, or going to watch live games. So you're still going to have the, the due diligence and the follow-up that they're going to go through. Um, you're still going to have them um, reaching out to you through email and, and giving you a call and, and um, you know, video conferencing, et cetera. Um, they will be breaking down tape. Now it's going to be pro the primary focus because they can't get eyes out uh, on you um, in, a, in your club or your high school atmosphere. And, and their assistant coaches aren't on the recruiting trail right now. So video is, is number one, it is king right now. Um, and video conferencing, like I mentioned, is gonna increase things like this, but uh, maybe um, informational uh, video conferences about uh, hosted by a coach or a program might start popping up as well as um, asking you to do one-on-one -on -one conferences. So uh, make sure that you, you are available um, or make yourself available when you are asked after you've contacted a coach um, to have a, a direct conversation through some sort of video conferencing um, system. <clears throat> and, I, and I think this, this last one was a, is a really big important one that a lot of the coaches shared with me was that they're looking for players that aren't using this off time as a crutch. They're looking for the player who gets proactive, the person who is, is not sitting at home playing video games, um, the person who's, who's not only out there training and working with the ball to keep themselves fresh, but also doing their due diligence on their end um, to reach out to coaches, to get in their inboxes, um, to leave the voice messages. Um, and, and, to, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's, it's absolutely crucial that um, you're on a level playing field right now with everyone else in your current situation. So if you are more proactive, you will start to stand out. And that could be a decider between um, getting an offer to play with the program or maybe even a scholarship offer um, with the university. And next, please, Adam. So when you're reaching out to coaches, uh, Adam talked about a little bit, start with the, the well-crafted email. What I mean by that is, you obviously want to, want to, to be succinct in your email and um, your communication, but you have to keep it short and to the point. These coaches are getting inundated with communications, uh, whether it's inside or outside of a pandemic, um, but probably now more so than ever. Um, and if you're reaching out to multiple coaches on, on a staff, um, you have to be to the point so that you, they don't throw your email out because it's too long or they don't understand what you're really trying to get uh, across in, in your communication. And I think you start your communication off with a very clear and engaging subject line. So something that will stand out in a crowded inbox, um, not just your, um, something that's, that's very basic, but, but, you know, creatively think about ways that you can use that subject line to your advantage um, to stand out. Spell checking. Uh, I, I can't, I can't uh, stress it enough. We get hundreds and, and, you know, in the last five years of our program, thousands of communication for players that want to come through and play, play with us and they're riddled with spelling errors or grammatical errors. Um, that to us and that to a college coach or a, a staff member on a college program, they're gonna look at that and immediately push it aside, no matter how good you are. Um, obviously, if you're good at soccer, that may, uh, that may help, but if, if, you, if you have uh, communication that's, that's not clear, it's, um, it's, it's riddled with errors, um, it's not gonna be anything that's in your favor. Um, so have another person read that message that, you, that you're going to send before you send it. So a parent or guardian, um, if, you're, if you're using anyone as a reference, maybe run the communication by them first to see what they think about it, to see if it does have, it is to the point, it has that engaging uh, subject line and obviously without errors. So when you're, when you're getting into the guts of your communication, um, introduce yourself and, and Explain what sets you apart from someone else who might be currently in the same situation as you. Um, what areas of study are you interested in? Um, if you don't know, it's okay to tell them that you're undecided on uh, what you want to go to school for. But if you immediately lead with just soccer, 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 um, these coaches are not just looking for soccer players, they're looking for student athletes. Um, so people who are interested in going to school as well as playing. Um, you also want to talk about why the school might be right for you. Uh, it could be a geographical area. Um, it could be something that's in your lineage. If, if your whole family went to a university and that's why you're interested in it, it's okay to say certain things like that. 
um, you know, specific locations or, or types of universities, whether it's a big school, like a big state school, or uh, a, a smaller liberal arts college, um, or maybe even, you know, a community college or an NAI school, um, tell them why the school is right for you. And then also tell them why you're a good fit for the program. Soccer is obviously the given piece, but um, talk about your character, talk about the things that you maybe do off the field that would help a program um, program out. And uh, kind of the no brainer here, obviously you gotta have your highlight video. Uh, you have to have some sort of tape that they can watch. Um, we'll talk a little bit uh, later about what coaches will be looking for in, in tape, but have that ready. Um, and if you haven't, it should be maybe the number one thing that you need to start doing after you get off of this, uh, this, this call is, is get your game tape and start to, to edit it down so that you can send something out to these coaches. And then obviously have full game tape available. Um, almost every single coach that we talked to said, yeah, highlight video, video is great, but you're not going to necessarily put um, any of, the, of the, the, the downsides of what you might have had in a game. Um, and a lot of coaches like to look at how you respond from maybe something that negatively happened to you because we're not all perfect throughout the course of a game you're going to make mistakes but it's how those coaches see you on film um, because they can't see you in person um, bouncing back from those mistakes is, is something that uh, again could be uh, a decider for for offering you a spot in their program awesome um so to kind of just piggyback on what john was saying so uh i'm matt i'm the head coach here at minneapolis city and just kind of want to chime in here a little bit um, so I think it's important for players as you go through this process to be able to, as you understand what it, what you can do dif to differentiate yourself, also to understand what it is that coaches are looking for. Can you kind of have a little bit of perspective taken from them? So as you're going through this process, understand that coaches, while they want to win here and now, here and now, they're also looking to address this kind of up to a two-year window. They're looking to build some debt. They're looking to build a program. Um, so you have to understand that you may not come in right away and start. You may not come in and right away and contribute. Um, and that's something you have to think about and figure out, is that something you want? Um, another big thing, academic qualifications. There's a big difference between state schools and Ivy League, private and public. Um, and, and that matters. And, and so if you're looking at certain schools, you have to understand what it is that they're going to be asking of you. What is the academic criteria? Um, and personally, as, as a former assistant college coach, I learned too late to not start with that question with players and ask them, where are you at? Where are your SATs? Because if, if it's not, if their scores aren't good, th then it's a non-starter and, and, and we can't have much of a conversation if you can't make it into the school. So that's a big thing. Um, program needs. The coaches are looking to fill out specific things for their program. They could be looking to add depth. They could be looking to add some scoring, um, maybe replace a player, things like that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of just program culture and what that looks like as well. Um, but understand that they're looking to fill certain roles. So if, you know, they have, you know, five center mids and, and you're the six coming in, you just may not be a good fit. Doesn't mean you're not a good player. It just may not be the right school at the right time for you. So be thinking about that. Um, like John said, they want players who are proactive. I can't tell you how, how much players stand out when they're the ones, especially as high school students, who are taking, a, um, who are taking the initiative to do it. Um, it's okay for mom and dad to be involved in the process. They should be. Um, it's a big decision. But when you can walk through a coach's door or send them an email or, you know, do a Zoom meeting like this to be able to tell them, hey, here's, here's what I want. Here's what I'm thinking about. Um, that says something about you. That helps you differentiate yourself. Like John said, um, with the email, and especially now, like be thorough in your communication. In, in the emails that we have to sit, sift through, we can pretty easily weed out the ones that we're going to delete within the first sentence. And those are the ones that are very generic. They're clearly copy and pasted. Um, so be clear about what it is that, that you want to do, why that school in particular might be a good fit for you. Um, because again, you're starting to differentiate yourself a little bit. Obviously this is not any different than being on the field as a player. Coaches want players who are versatile and adaptable. If you're, you know, I, I only play as a 10 or I only play as, you know, a right back. Um, you know, be careful about what you say. You can say that might be your strength, but the more you can communicate the fact that you're open, you're flexible, you're versatile, um, that goes a long way with coaches to be able to, to understand who you are. Really like players who do their homework. When you can come in and say something to a coach about their program that tells them that they are just not another check mark on their list, on your list. If you can come in and say, man, you guys did really well last year and you finished this and I really like watching this player. 
um, and have an idea of what it is and, and then be able to ask specific questions about the culture of that program. What, what is it that you're trying to do as a coach here? Um, and while this is kind of them interviewing you as a player, this is also you as the player interviewing the coach. Um, and it's a big decision because you shouldn't just be saying, well, you know, hey, the coach wants me here. I want to be here. Is it something that you want? And, and I think the underlying current of all this is to be confident, right? You don't want players who are cocky. They don't want to come in and they're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be the best player out here. Be confident. Be, hey, you know, I, I can stand on my two feet. I have an idea of what I want. Um, and this is what I'm looking to get out of my experience, both on and off the field. Next slide. Uh, and like I said, have an idea of what you want. And, and, and John alluded to a little bit, um, there's a lot of very different college experiences. And, and I, I think that, that ultimately you are going to school to get a degree, right? And soccer can be a great catalyst for that. It can even get you some scholarship money. That's fantastic. But you should be, the objective should be, I'm leaving here with a four year degree. What do I want that to be? What do I want my experience to be like? Um, and there's a lot of different things. Is it in the city? Is it, is it um, you know, rural? Is it in-state, out-of-state, public, private, class size? All these different things that you can start to narrow down now to say, you know, this is an idea of what, what I want my experience to be. Um, especially now, the, uh, most schools are, you can take a virtual tour. Take, an, take a look at like what the campus looks like. Um, you might have a preconceived notion of what something is like, and then you get there, you see it like, oh man, that's drastically different. Um, not at all what I was expecting and thinking about, you know, do I, is this somewhere where I can be for two to four years? Um, and as you can continue to get into it, meet one-on-one -on -one with coaches. Um, hopefully you can do it in person. Obviously we don't know with COVID how all, all of this plays out, but that's going to tell you a lot when you talk to somebody face-to-face -face and you can get an idea from them as to what they're about. They can get an idea of what you're about. Um, and you're not just going into that blind because, you know, there's some good coaches, there's some not some good coaches, and I'm probably in the, the latter category. So, um, kidding. But um, again, going back to academics, have your ACT and SAT scores sorted out. That's such a big thing because if, if again, you don't fit that criteria, um, it's not even a good, you, you can't, it's not even a, a next step after that. Um, so make sure you're on top of that. Make sure you know what schools that you want to go in, what they're asking, what the ACT is, SAT, if they need both. Um, that's a big thing. Like John said, highlights. Um, and, you know, highlight package that showcases your complete set of skills and have a full game video on demand. Now, again, most coaches aren't going to sit there and watch you for 90 minutes. But there's a big difference between, you know, I can't tell you how many highlight tapes went back when I was recruiting. I would watch and it was 10 minutes of, this person doing a nutmeg and they do a tap in goal or, you know, something like that. And, and as a coach, you look at them that and say, well, I hope you can do that. Like, that's great. But the one, but to give you an example of one that stood out to me was even 10 years later, there's one player who got beat as a midfielder, another player ran past him, attack ran past him. He tracked that player back from 40 yards behind him, made the tackle and won the ball. And to, to this day, that still stands out to me. Cause it's like, look, it's not about, what you can do in some ways I'm more interested in seeing if you make that mistake, what are you going to do about it? Right. And so if you can do kind of a little bit more broad spectrum of, Hey, here's, here's how I see the game. Here's how I read the game. Here's my decision-making. And it's not just, you know, a YouTube highlight video that that does a lot for you. And last but not least, as we get to the player part here, be patient. Um, coaches are human beings. We try to do our best to stay on top of stuff. Um, but especially now in where we're at, coaches are worried about, are we going to have a season this fall? And what does that look like? Um, and so if they don't get back to you immediately, be patient, give them some time. Um, and you can be persistent, but don't be intrusive. Um, you can be professional in how you follow up if you don't hear from somebody, um, but give them some patience. Let them try to sort through a lot of this stuff and, and they will get to you. So that's all I got. Okay, um, so this is uh, this is Adam, and I'm just going to introduce our player panel. So, because you know, you're not going to hear from our staff until we get back to the Q and A. Um, plenty of us talking, and you know, when you come out and you're a player with Minneapolis City later, you'll get plenty more from the technical staff. Um, but we think it's really going to be most valuable for you guys to hear from the players that have gone through the process. So um, I'm going to introduce each player, with uh, starting with Max Diewert, one of our uh, first team 
captains. Um, Max is a prolific player in the Twin Cities, and all of them are uh, at one point of time and another. Uh, Max went on to Louisville and transferred to Central Florida, played it in uh, the U.S. Youth National Team in their, uh, in their various training camps, um, and is now, again, captain for Minneapolis City and a stalwart in the midfield. Will Kidd, um, another Twin City player, went on to play Division I at Bradley and transferred back to St. Thomas, um, where they experienced a number of very successful years in no, no small part due to Will's attacking prowess. Um, Will Kidd is, uh, I believe, the highest scoring player in Minneapolis City history. Um, and you're, you'll find him on that first team um, somewhere, either on the wing or up top, uh, throwing his body at things and scoring goals. Max Kent um, comes from St. Louis Park. He, he is a graduating senior from McAllister and is actually a grad transfer to uh, Division I Syracuse, um, hopefully this upcoming fall. Uh, Max Kent um, is a wildly talented center back defender, um, very athletic, uh, extremely smart, and, and driven. So um, Max had probably could have gone to any university that he chose and um, chose the McAllister and the great academic school. And we're really excited to see uh, him grad transfer and play a year at Division I. Jonah Garcia uh, is another center back for Minneapolis City. Came on the scene after playing for a few other NPSL clubs. Um, and he is, uh, after he came to Minneapolis City last year, he quickly uh, became someone that we couldn't replace on the field. He is a, a great leader, um, a phenomenal communicator. Um, he's well-liked by all his peers. He played at Wisconsin Superior um, and, and, and had a wonderful career there and set all sorts of records at Wisconsin Superior in terms of uh, their team success. Um, and now he's here leading the way for Minneapolis City. Kevin Hoof uh, comes to us. He's a, another Twin City guy that grew up uh, playing with Max Stewart and a number of other Minneapolis City players. But Kevin Hoof is a utility player that is good at any number of things. Um, his vision and passing, um, and he's also a really tough tackler. Uh, Kevin went and played at Olivet Nazarene and then transferred to Northern Michigan. Um, and so he had a wonderful college career, led his team there in a number of different categories and comes to us playing uh, any, anywhere across the defense, center defensive midfielder, and can move forward up the field as well. Um, so I can't say enough about this group of players that we have here. Again, all very, very high level players um, that have experienced that college recruiting pathway in, in any number of ways, and they're all very well spoken. So um, with that, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Max Stewart, who's gonna talk a little bit about his college recruiting experience. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, thanks for coming in today. I'm Max Stiegwart. I was born and raised in South America. I lived there for about five years before moving to the States, lived in Chicago for a year, and then we decided to move to Minnesota for my dad's job, which I grew up playing for PSA, which is now Fusion, seems like way back in the day, and then actually met Kevin Hoff through PSA, and from there we both switched to, to Minnesota Thunder Academy. Um, played there till I was about 16. I was in and out with the national team. We did, I think, six international camps I went to. With We went down to Mexico, we went to Netherlands, we went to France. Um, really, really cool stuff representing the U.S. Um, from there, I moved down to South Florida from my, my dad's job. We moved down there, finished out my academy days playing there, and then I went to Louisville for college. Um, I think Louisville was an awesome fit for me. I loved it. I was there for two years. And the reason I decided to transfer was because my sophomore year, we lost our assistant coach, who I absolutely loved, and our complete playing style changed. So we went from being a really possession, like attacking sort of team to kind of just sitting back and absorbing pressure and, you know, going kind of long ball stuff. And that really wasn't my game. So I felt like I needed to change the scenery. And that was a tough decision I had to make for myself, um, putting friendships aside, you know, all the friendships I had made there. I had to put that aside. And then as I was transferring that spring, 
um, the team didn't let me train with them, which is understandably so, because I wasn't going to be with that team in the fall. So I had to find ways to stay fit. Um, luckily, I was able to train with a uh, USL pro team, U Louisville City, that, that spring. And then from there, I had offers from Creighton, Portland, and UCF were my top three. And I decided to go to UCF because I knew Scott Calabrese, the head coach. He was the head coach at FIU when I was in high school. And I knew he was a very possession-oriented type coach that loved attacking, um, just kind of the system I grew up playing in. And he, I remember him on the phone with us, and he was like, hey, you know, UCF right now, they're ranked maybe in the top 100, but I want to come in and I want to change that program and, and do something special. And that's exactly what we did. So I went there. We, um, the, my very first year there, we went from being a top 100 school to a top 25 school. And then my senior year, we left um, the program as a top 10 school. And now actually being done for a year, they're actually a top five program. So that's pretty cool stuff that I was able to be a part of that, um, winning a conference championship. And yeah, that was, that's about my story for me. And Max, can you tell uh, why did you choose to transfer to Central Florida over the other schools? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was, it was a little bit of everything, right? I knew Central Florida is one of the biggest it's one of the biggest schools in the country and I'm I'm a very outgoing person you know I love to to meet new people and, and be around like just fun things in general um and being a school that's in Orlando 70,000 people 80 degree weather every year you know I, in Louisville when it was January right we like trained in the dome on, on turf and you know I was ready for, for a little something different so I remember it was, it was January in Orlando it's 65 75 degrees is absolutely perfect you're training on grass all year round um and then, you know, Creighton was, was a smaller school. It was more, it was a private school as well. Um, just, and then having lived in Minnesota for 14 years, I just kind of wanted a warmer scenery. And I think it was the right fit for me. Same thing with Portland, just being all the way up Northwest. I think it was going to be a little too, not too cold for me, but I just really enjoyed the, the luxury of, of being able to live in Orlando. And did you have, how much conversations did you have with these college coaches through the through that process of you deciding where you're going to transfer to um I probably spoke to them at least once a week all of them to be honest um they were always calling in checking in on how I was doing in training I know they called my uh head coach at Louisville and he had nothing but great things to say which was awesome um they called the Louisville City coaches that I was in and out with training um you know they wanted to see how I was doing there so it was kind of contact every week or so for sure so it sounds like the way you handled even leaving Louisville was really important because you had a good relationship with your Louisville college coach yeah absolutely and I think I know a lot of guys that had negative experiences trying to transfer and you know coaches have the ability to not allow you to transfer you know for certain reasons they can say hey like I'm not signing off on your on your transfer papers and you're, then you're not allowed to transfer or play somewhere else I know my coach had told me I just couldn't go to Indiana or Kentucky University because those were our two big rival schools. So I was blocked from transferring to those schools, but they were never in my interest, to be honest. Thanks for that. That's really good information. And I, yeah. I think it's also, it's really good to, for everyone to understand that too, with, especially if you're in that category of getting a college scholarship, that they are renewed every year. There's no such thing as a four-year full ride or you know so um, I would say that it's really traditional for coaches to renew those scholarships you have to do something decently egregious to to have that scholarship taken away but um, that is a it's a one-year scholarship that is renewed for those for as long as you're at the university so yeah I, just one last point so I just add to John's point about how he said it's really important how you reach out to schools um, just with my soccer resume, um, I expected to be reached out to by a bunch of schools. And I got to about my junior year and, you know, I'd heard from a couple of schools, but that really wasn't the case how I expected. So it wasn't until about, I think the second semester of my junior year of high school, I spoke to my uncle who's a, the head tennis coach at ETSU. And he was like, hey, no man, like you have to reach out to schools. You know, you have to set a proper email. And like John said, you know, find something that interests you about the school that, that you want to go to outside of just soccer. And it wasn't until I started reaching out to coaches and, you know, planning phone calls and whatnot with them that I started to get more interested in schools and they started to get more interested in me. So I think marketing yourself is a really, really big key, especially if you're looking to play at the next level. Very cool. Thanks for that, Max. We're going to move on to Will Kidd. Will? 
Yeah, uh, hey everybody, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Um, yeah, I'll just get into my story. Um, I am born and raised in St. Paul. I, uh, I uh, played at Minneapolis United, uh, St. Croix Academy, um, went to Como Park High School, and then, um, yeah, the recruiting process. Um, I have to say the most important, uh, they touched on it earlier, and Max also touched on it, uh, most important part of the recruiting process, I would have to say, is marketing yourself. Um, I'm more of an introverted type of guy, and uh, and I wasn't really inclined to go out and uh, market myself, basically. And luckily, I had a I had a mom that was in advertising, so she could she knew how to market and helped me market myself. And um, I can get into all the things she did for me, all the tips and tricks uh, in the questions if people are interested, but. Yeah, that's like one of the most important things I think with recruiting. Um, and another thing in the recruiting process, I think uh, could have helped me and uh, other people and uh, other people would be like keeping an open mind uh, with schools. Um, I was uh, I I want to say I was uh, not biased towards like Division One schools, but um, in that recruiting process, I was looking at division one through three schools, but uh, I definitely had a bias towards division one. And once I got an offer from Bradley University, I, I gave that a harder look than other schools. So I ended up taking that offer. It was a, I came in as a walk-on uh, and uh, I just took it as an opportunity to prove myself and try to get into that lineup freshman year. And I ended up having a really good freshman year, started like five, my first five games um was in and out of the starting lineup all year and we actually ended up doing pretty well uh ended the year in like third on the table and it was a it was a good year especially for Bradley University and then and then after my uh after my freshman year we went into my sophomore year feeling good um the team was feeling good we felt we had like a good year coming because of the previous year and we had a lot of seniors coming back and I felt good personally because of my pretty good freshman year and you know I was like the same thing my sophomore year uh started in and out of the starting lineup and that was great but I think a lot of people have to uh keep in mind when they're choosing the schools like the quality of the school I had no idea this was going to happen so I was completely blindsided but we had a terrible year my sophomore year. We won only two games, lost like 18, and it was just a terrible environment for me. Um, uh, it was just it uh, like basically almost ruined soccer for me. I mean, I was not having fun, and that's when I started to look out to other schools, and I saw St. Thomas had a really good year that year, and I had a couple buddies that were going there, and I was also looking because I was an engineer, that's another reason I chose Bradley and St. Thomas was the only school back home that like had an engineering program and a soccer program. So I was looking at that pretty heavily. And then I got the invite from my friends over there to come to St. Thomas. So I pulled the trigger and went there and it was the best decision I've ever made soccer wise. Um, I went from uh, only winning two games my sophomore year to only losing two games my junior year, went to an elite eight, was a uh, started every game it was just it was just one of the funnest or the one of the best times I had playing soccer and then senior year he was the captain um got a bunch more stats a bunch more accolades and yeah it was one of the best decisions I made and that's yeah that's pretty much my story with the whole college experience thanks for that Will so just yeah. a couple couple follow-up questions it seems like one of your big piece of advice is to kind of have your mind open to all different college experiences or different levels of the college game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because division one through three, there's not a big difference between all that. You, these teams can compete with any other team, no matter the division. So just really look at the school and what fits best for you, I would say. That's really, really good advice, especially in Minnesota um without having that division one yet i would say the you know, i i would argue that the level of play in in minnesota in d3 is is very high um so i think that's a really good 
feedback from Will. Um, and, and obviously, I think the key piece then I heard from Will is that he had to find schools that had an engineering program. Um, and any of these guys that you've seen on here that are going to, that have transferred, I think it's always important that soccer is not a given, you know, injuries happen, uh, bad seasons happen, a lot of things can happen and you, you want to make sure you're in a place where you enjoy the school if, if there's no soccer. Obviously, if you're playing at a high level and you're trying to play college soccer, that is going to be a huge part. But again, find the, find the right fit. And, uh, and don't just make a soccer decision. Uh, Max Kent. What's up, everybody? Um, thank you for bearing with us thus far. Um, like, I won't, try to, I won't try to bore everyone with redundancies, but uh, no promises. Um, I, I actually start off by just saying, like, for, you know, whatever, whoever you are, I mean, like, if you're a coach, if you're a player, your parent, you know, even just somebody who's like looking to kind of gain more knowledge about this kind of stuff. Um, this is like, I mean, above and beyond what you know, I think any of us really knew about the process uh, of recruiting before we went. So, I mean, I'm hoping that like this kind of thing is that, you know, after this, you guys will have this available to you, which I'm assuming that they have, it, they will make it available. But this is, I mean, they're providing you the blueprint to this. Um, so, you know, that should be, you know, enough to, to at least watch one game in the coming seasons. Um, I would start, I mean, so I'm, I am from St. Louis Park, like uh, uh, Pribble uh, mentioned before. I grew up playing at Minneapolis United. Um, and similar to Will, you know, I, I grew up and, you know, was a good high school player uh, and a good club player. Um, but for Minnesota, and so there wasn't, there weren't Division One coaches coming to knock on my door, uh, and you know, a few Division Three coaches, um, you know, in the MIAC knocking, you know, asking to to come play there. And you know, I had to be pretty honest with myself. You know, at, you know, definitely at some point moments in my life, I, I I had aspirations to play Division One soccer. Both my parents played it at Madison, so. Um, there was always a, a an ex, not an expectation, but there was always kind of that uh, looming over me. Um, so when I push came to shove, and I, I started to realize that uh, the Division One uh, path wasn't necessarily going to be as as easy or as um, you know scar free as uh, as going Division Three, I thought, well, it'd be it's a great opportunity to to make the most of what's in front of me. And so uh, I looked at all the division three schools uh, around the country um, and thought, okay, what's the best fit for me academically and what's the strongest school I can get into um, and what fits my soccer um, kind of level. And at the time I was looking at McAllister because of that they had come off an undefeated season um, and, you know, academically the school speaks for itself. Um, you know, I've had, I had three great years at McAllister. It was, you know, from the beginning, I, I was able to play right away. Um, and I thought that was, you know, really the, the joy of, uh, of playing division three soccer was basically like Will said, barely missing a game because, you know, you're at, you're playing at a level that's high. Um, oh, sorry if I'm cutting off a little bit. Um, but you're, you're also, uh, you're you're producing a, a level of skill and and determination and talent um, that also sets you apart from guys who are um, lower down uh, in Division Three. Um, unfortunately, this summer when I was when we were playing Rochester um, with City, we I uh, or I should, I should say last summer um, had a knee injury uh, and we missed my senior year. Um, so I quickly kind of turned my attention towards playing at, uh, at in grad school, you know, where I knew where to go, um, wasn't necessarily, you know, known at the time. Um, and Syracuse came up on my list because I was interested in, in their public administration program. Um, and, you know, one of the main things that I kind of got away from this experience is that, you know, there are, I mean, thousand, I mean, millions of, of players all over the country looking to play 
division one soccer and college soccer in general. Um, and so you're, you're competing against a very large pool of players. And so when you're going to, you know, send a, an email to, you know, big schools like University of Wisconsin, Duke, Clemson, you have to consider that not only are you competing against other kids in the country to make a roster, you know, one of the 30 roster spots, you're also competing with kids from all over the world. Teams now are composed of, of kids, you know, from all over because the coaches realize the international nature of college soccer um, and American soccer more generally. So being honest with yourself about what your level is right now, where you see your, your ceiling by the time you're done with high school and what level that will fit in. Um, I say that not because I want to burst bubbles. I don't want to come here and say, you're not good enough to play division one soccer. No, no, I, you might not be right now, but I assure you it'll save you time and energy, which in the college recruiting process is very valuable. Um, I actually, uh, speaking of which I, I had a conversation with, uh, my 2B coach, uh, Ian McIntyre, out at Syracuse today about, you know, what he's looking for in players um, during this time. And first he said, you just got to be calm, right? You just, like I think uh, John said earlier, you know, realizing that everybody is going through this and that, you know, you're not the only one who is unable to play at the moment uh, is a really big component of it. A component of it. The other part is that you got to be ready to hit the ground running. Um, you know, there, you got to be ready once the time comes to, you know, go to ID camps or playing games or um, even just visit schools, you want to be ready to um, present yourself in the best possible way. So um, I won't, I won't go on any further, but uh, if there's any follow-up questions, I'm, I'm here. So, uh, Max, I just wanted to to ask, so it sounds like, I mean, you, you made your decision on which college to go to. Was it was it mostly soccer? Or what, what kind of went into that? Yeah, I mean, I would have to say the the biggest factor for me was was academics. Um, you know, when I was coming out of high school, the you know, the only schools, D Division one schools, um, and division two schools that I was, I was getting offers from were schools that to me weren't, weren't meeting my standard academically. And um, so I, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to play at a, you know, I wasn't going to get an offer from a Princeton or a Northwestern, uh, even a Madison um, at the time, because the, the level of soccer, they were looking for guys who were playing um, at a much higher level and I didn't fit that realm. So um, like I said, you know, I, I just quickly, uh, put my time and energy, you know, looking at very high academic schools um, that also had a good soccer component. So I looked in Minnesota, uh, California, Washington, out east, um, just kind of wherever. Sure. And I'll ask this uh, before we move on to Jonah. You know, if you could go back and tell, you know, 18-year-old, 17-year-old Max Kent something – um, based on what you know now, uh, what advice would you have given to that your younger self? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would say the best advice would would be to, that nothing is is final when you decide on a school right right out of high school. Um, I think everybody, I think other than Jonah here, transferred at some point, um, which begs you know, which shows that you know there's no. Uh, just because you choose a school right out of high school does not mean the plans will change um, one or two years uh, afterwards, right? And, and you know, whether it's going, you know, putting your sights on playing Division One soccer and, and making the, the decision to play at a junior college or a Division Two school, um, or even just a Division Three school, uh, you're, you're realizing that this is not the last decision you're ever going to make in terms of soccer um, is definitely something I would have loved to hear going through the process that's a great it's a great perspective um and just you know just make a note on that is that we have we work with a lot of players that have played community college have gone the juco route have then transferred on to a larger university at, at a division level 
um, or sometimes they just have really great careers at a JUCO level. Um, and I guess that's an important piece to understand about that this college recruiting process is, like you said earlier, Max, um, start to be real with yourself, have conversations with any coaches or soccer mentors, whatever, you know, and, and try to get real feedback on what level you think you can play at. Um, and, and I would argue you can use Minneapolis City as well. So whether through our open tryout process or coming in and using us as resources to figure out, you know, what level you can play at um, and how to best get there, that's certainly, you know, that's, that's kind of why we're here. Thanks, Max. Uh, Jonah Garcia. Yeah, um, thanks for joining us. Um, so I'll just give you just a little bit of background just from where I'm from and then kind of my recruiting process. Um, I'm from Egan, so I graduated from Egan High School in 2014. I played for a club called Dakota Rev at the time. Um, it's called Salvo now, ever since they merged with Woodbury. Um, I played for a premier level club, but it was like a mid table team. So it wasn't on the higher end of MYSA premier soccer, but still a good team regardless. Um, quite a few of our guys were going to play college soccer. Um, most of them division three, uh, but for my recruiting process, um, I was actually the first person in my family. So a first generation college student. So before I even went through the recruiting process, I had to go and consider colleges that my family could afford. Um, and just prior to going into my senior year, I had just gone through just a self-evaluation period um, as a soccer player, just to see kind of where I was at. And I knew I wasn't gonna go to like a top division three. I wasn't even considering division one. I, I kind of knew my skill set, and um, I wasn't in like the best physical shape to go play a good D3, but I knew I could play at like a mid table D3 or a division three in Wisconsin. So. Um, just kind of looking around at what I could afford because um, obviously education was super important, but I also didn't want to put too much of a burden on my family. Um, I chose UW Superior. So this was actually like the only look I had at the time. And the only reason I got it was because I reached out to the head coach, um, Joe Mooney, again, UW Superior. And I just contacted him and said, Hey, like, I don't have very many colleges that like I'm interested in right now or considering um, would you be interested? Obviously, I had well-scripted email, kind of like John mentioned earlier in the uh, PowerPoint, but I just asked him if he wanted to come out and watch one of my games because I knew he was looking at one other player on my club team and my high school team. We were playing at Egan and club together because my family didn't have the resources either to put together a huge um, highlight tape. They weren't willing to pay for the recording and all that stuff. Um, I know it's important, but we just didn't have it at the time. So I just went the email route. I asked him if he wanted to come watch me play. I just kind of gave him my playing resume, the club I was with. And he was coming. He was going to come watch us play. And it was our Egan High School section final. Um, it went well for me. So he wanted to bring me on board and then come for a tour. Um, I know those tours aren't available at the moment for colleges, but that's also like a really big part for me, which is getting my foot in the door and being able to go to a college and communicate with the coach even better. Um, Cause I consider myself a pretty good communicator once in person. Um, and obviously he was looking for a good person, not just someone that could play soccer, um, whatever it be, but um, the recruiting trip went well. I met the team and um, I signed my letter of intent, I guess you call it for division three. Um, it was the first college I contacted and that was the one I went with just cause it fit my family's budget. Um, and again, I don't regret at all going to Superior. Like it was a great experience, but I just, I knew my potential at the time. And I knew once I got my foot in the door and got into a college program, I could build up from there. So I got there my freshman year. I was just self-aware. I knew I wouldn't be starting. I knew I wouldn't be getting a ton of minutes. I was getting like 15 to 20 minutes a game at the division three level. They were in the WIAC at the time. So the Wisconsin Athletic Conference. Um, but I just got there, kind of put my head down and got to work, just looking to better myself as a college player. And then I went into my sophomore year, developed a lot from my freshman to sophomore year summer, and then actually started all but four games my sophomore year. So I made a huge improvement from freshman to sophomore year and uh, just kind of backtrack like my freshman year getting like I said, I got my foot in the door. 
my goal was to eventually transfer to hopefully a top end MIAC team. So the Minnesota Athletic Conference teams like um, St. Thomas, McAllister, um, Gustavus, um, Augsburg, those types of teams. Um, but I actually fell in love with the school. And at the end of my sophomore year, I was named a captain. So I was going to be a two year captain. Um, and we had just moved into the upper Minnesota Athletic Conference. So we moved conferences, which gave us a better chance um, to make it to the national tournament. Uh, the WIAC didn't have um, a straight entry into the tournament. And that one was just on bid. So us moving into the upper Minnesota Athletic Conference actually kept me at Superior. I really liked the head coach. I liked my teammates. And then obviously getting the captain band moving into my junior year helped a lot. Um, and then going into my senior year, uh, that was really going to be the year because we had just missed out my junior year of going to the national tournament. So then senior year rolled around. We won our conference final, um, the tournament, and actually played Will and the St. Thomas guys uh, in the first round of the national tournament and made history with, with the rest of my teammates at Superior. Um, and again, just to backtrack, it all just started with me getting my foot in the door with a college program and just and building it up from there. And that came from from very little resources, no highlight tape, nothing. It just it was a well crafted email going out to a head coach asking him to come watch me play, um, and the rest was was history from there. So, Jonah, that's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I want to highlight, just like Jonah said, the um, you know, and there's a question earlier in this session um, from Nick Barkley who who'd asked about you know, specifically for populations that maybe we, maybe you don't have that game tape, um, cause that's a lot kind of easier said than done. Um, or if you don't have all the resources, you know, how do you, how do you go about getting that exposure? And I think Jonah kind of illustrated that really well. And, and my whole thing listening to Jonah was that he made the best of every opportunity he had. So really well-crafted email, um, when he was able to have competition, he reached out and let the college coach know his schedule and he was able to get seen. Um, but in, in everything that he did, he presented himself well, you know, so if that one game, he gets a red card or he's goofing off on the bench or whatever, it's, it's an entirely different story. And you kind of think about that. Max talked a little bit about how competitive it is. You saw the percentages. So, you know, I just think that it's about using all of your opportunities the best you can. And, you know, and there's no saying that it's definitely more challenging at times when you don't have all the resources. And that's where we do really encourage people in the community to reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with people that can help. There are various community partners of ours that, that have similar resources that we can connect you with. So just, just use what you have. And, and we just want to be one of those extra tools in your toolbox. Jonah, I am going to ask you a quick question um, because, you know, I was a little bit older and I didn't have social media when I played like in high school um, and, and thankfully so. Um, but, you know, did you, did that ever come up in your recruiting about, you know, like, did you have to, You'd be conscious of how you use social media if you did? Um, I don't think that was ever brought up. Could you reword that question for me? Just so I can yeah, so like, you know, so I guess as a, even as a high school coach and an athletic director, I, I remember having several conversations with players about um, they had to scrub their Twitter uh, or Instagram or whatever, just to, to, to kind of, the, those social media outlets are your, your persona. So I just didn't know if like, if you are a big, you know, social media guy, if that ever came up in your recruiting process yourself. Yeah. I mean, not in the recruiting process, but I mean, it's, it's important regardless. Um, when I was in college, just an incident happened with the team and someone put something on social media. And I mean, that quick, that player was kicked off the team. Um, and obviously that would translate to a recruiting process as well. I mean, now it's just, easy access for anyone to see the things you post or the things you do. So like a coach can take a look at whatever it be your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter. And if they're not liking the things that I don't know, you share or kind of like represent in a way, I mean, 
they can easily back out at taking you. So yeah, social media, super yeah. important. Um, oh yeah, one thing I did want to mention too, um, forgot to cover it, but um, for those of you that are juniors or seniors in high school, moving into your senior year, um, definitely don't let the senior slide happen in high school. Um, one of the players that I was recruited with from my club and high school team did let that senior slide come around and he went into his freshman year of college on academic probation. So definitely something you don't want to start with. And he didn't even make it to the end of his first semester, um, just based on the pressure of hitting a 3.3 GPA um, that you needed to hit due to being on academic probation. So uh, again, just to go over how important the, the education part of things are, like just, just do it right your senior year so that you go into college um, with, with the right mindset and set up the right way, so. Awesome. Thanks so much. Two little, just to back off of Jonah, off of Jonah's points for social media instances, actually. So I know two guys. One guy, he was coming out of high school with me in Florida, and he had a full ride offer to UNC Chapel Hill. And later on, the school found out that he had tweeted some vulgar stuff, and they dropped his scholarship like that. And he actually didn't end up playing Division One. He ended up playing community college soccer, and then from there transferred to a D3 school. But just like that, going from being a top D1 prospect because of something he posted on Twitter for 30 minutes, he got back to the school and the school had said, that's not someone we want representing UNC. And then actually when we were at Louisville, we had an international guy who was overage, posted a picture on Instagram of him chugging a beer and he was kicked from the team the very next day. Even though he was of age, it just wasn't how the, the soccer team wanted to be represented. And he was a starting goalkeeper at the time too, but the school and the team thought, you know, that's, that's not how we re represent ourselves and decided to take action. Thanks for that, Max. Yeah, it, I mean, there's a lot of different stories of that. And I think the key that to take away is that, um, it, again, very competitive and you have to do everything you can to, to represent yourself well and to stand out and to be someone that that university or college would be willing to you know, when they put their logo and their colors on you that, that you're representing the school and really being a part of that program. Uh, last and certainly not least, uh, we have Kevin Hoof. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's okay. I thought I just got hoofed by you. You forgot about me, but that's all right. Uh, no, uh, kind of like Adam said, I started out at Olivet Nazarene, transferred order, over to Northern Michigan. Um, kind of my recruiting process, I was blessed to have parents and a club team uh, where we'd go to all the tournaments, all the showcases that we could. Uh, I know not everybody has access to that, but I was able to go on uh, all of those tournaments where you get in front of a bunch of college coaches. Um, and just to add to Adam's point from earlier, those coaches are constantly watching the, the benches, constantly watching your behavior. Uh, how you interact with coaches, other players. Um, so when you're on those tournaments, it's very important to uh, be professional at all times. Um, but um, continuing on, uh, I went to a lot of those different showcases. I went to a lot of different ID camps. My uh, dad was able to drive me around every other weekend uh, to go to those different ID camps. Um, visit a bunch of different schools, a bunch of players, uh, coaches. Uh, so I was very lucky uh, to kind of get the exposure to a lot of different places. Um, uh, the way I found all of it at Nazarene, I was actually at a ID camp for Northern Illinois University. And uh, the Olivet Nazarene coaching staff was all there. And they were actually just watching practice drills. Um, they weren't even watching any scrimmages. Um, any games, anything like that. Uh, they just saw me and a couple other guys in some very simple drills, um, just taking it very seriously, um, taking it to perfection, passing the ball to the right foot, um, holding each other accountable for any bad touches, any mistakes that we shouldn't have made, um, even with tired legs. Um, so that just goes to show that, again, college coaches are watching absolutely everything that you do, um, even the small things. Um, so they kind of caught, we kind of caught their eye on that small drill. Um, they introduced themselves to us after the drills. And then from there, uh, we invited them and we kept, kept in contact with them. Um, if I was ever going to go to any tournaments or showcases that was going to be near the Illinois area, I would be make sure 
I would make sure to send an email out to the coaches um, as well as the Northern Illinois coach or anybody in that area that I was interested in. I would just send an email out saying like, hey, uh, my name is Kevin Hoof. I'm interested in your schools. Um, obviously, I'd gear it more towards that one school. It wasn't a mass email. That'd be a very bad idea. Um, but I'd send an email to each individual coach saying I was going to be in the area for a showcase. Um, this is my schedule. I'd love for you to come out and watch um, and introduce myself to you. Um, so that's something that was very important is just when you go to those showcases, make sure you're making college coaches aware of it. Um, they're not just going to know that you're on uh, this club team and this age group at, at this tournament. Um, they don't follow you that closely um, unless you're like the number one recruit in the nation. Uh, so just making sure that you are very – uh, good with your communication and making sure those college coaches know where you're going to be, what your schedule is, all that good stuff. Um, but from there, that's kind of how I went to all of that Nazarene. I got some non-scholarship opportunities with different universities that were division one, um, some D three schools in Minnesota, um, in the Mayak. Um, but then all of that Nazarene really stuck out to me. Uh, they had a national uh, team, team that was going to nationals every other year. Um, they had the academic program that I wanted. Um, I wasn't necessarily entirely sure what I wanted to be doing. I know I wanted to do psychology, and they had a psychology program that was uh, pretty renowned, so I decided that would be a good fit there. Um, and then thirdly, um, another huge factor was they stuck a big uh, wad of cash in front of my face. Um, that was kind of irresistible, uh, paying for all of my school, taking a big burden off of my parents, obviously, um, them kind of pushing that my way as well. Um, so I decided to take that. Um, and there's one key thing that I kind of left out of that whole equation, uh, if you didn't hear it, but uh, it was the environment of the school. Um, Jeremiah, I saw your question in the chat. Um, and the environment is something that I completely disregarded. I didn't really do too much research on it. Uh, I did do a school visit and went there and kind of was on campus, um, but it was during the summer. So it wasn't when school was actually running and I got to see everything that was going on. Um, so I didn't really get to get a good feel for the environment. So when I got there, that was one thing that uh, I really struggled with and what drove me away from the university. Uh, which led me to wanting to transfer to Northern Michigan. Um, and my transferring process wasn't as smooth as Max Stegwartz, as he kind of mentioned earlier, how he had a really good relationship with the coach. Um, I did have a good relationship with the coach up until the moment I told him that I wasn't enjoying my time at the university and I wanted to transfer. Um, nothing against the coach. Uh, he really liked me. We had a great relationship. Um, he even told me that he – he really wanted me to be a captain at some point and this and that uh, to try to keep me there. But it just wasn't something that was going to fit for me. And that was one of the hardest conversations I've had to have, had to have with a college coach uh, when I'm 18 years old. Um, but it was also the most important conversation I've had to have with somebody um, really kind of sticking up for what I needed at the time. And I knew that I wasn't happy at that university and that wasn't going to be a good long-term fit. So those hard conversations um, are scary, but you need to have them. Um, and so the transferring process was very difficult. He wouldn't give me the signature I needed in order to have permission. I talked to other colleges um, and really start looking at places where I could transfer. He told me as well, I wouldn't be able to practice with the team in spring. Uh, so over winter break, I was reaching out to coaches like crazy, trying to find my next place that I was going to transfer. And one day I got a phone call from the uh, new college coach at Northern Michigan University. Didn't even have a program yet. Um, didn't even have a set number of players yet uh, going into the spring. Uh, the coach said it was going to be a brand new team, inaugural season for fall of 2016. Um, new opportunity. How often do you really get to start a program from the ground up? Uh, a lot of the universities you're going to go to have had a program for how many years? Um, this one, I would be the first player to ever sign for that university. So a uh, very unique situation. Um, I kind of took it overnight. Um, soccer was a big factor. 
They had the academic program I wanted as well, actually. They have a, one of the first neuroscience programs in the country at the time. Um, uh, solid program, psychology department in general. And if you've ever seen Marquette, Michigan, where Northern Michigan lies, it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm an outdoors person, so I did some research on that. It sits right on Lake Superior. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so it, it kind of just fit everything I was looking for. Uh, went and visited uh, over one weekend, and I transferred that same exact weekend. Drove down to Illinois, grabbed my stuff, ran back up, moved in, and started the next day for school. Uh, so it was a pretty crazy weekend, but uh, best decision I've ever made uh, transferring order over to Northern Michigan for sure. So not the most traditional transfer I'd say, but yeah. So um, Kevin, if you were to, because you did a good job at answering one of the questions, um, kind of taking a look at academics, athletics, and environment. Um, but it, so if you were to go back in time, or if you could go back to 17 year old Kevin, would you give him any advice or tell him to do anything different or? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I would, I would say keep my, take the blinders off. Um, I think I had some blinders. I really wanted to play D one at the time. It was D one or D three. Um, which is funny cause I played at an NAI school and a division two school. Um, but I only looked at division one and I only looked at division three. I didn't for some reason even touch division two. Um, I knew I wanted to be out of the state. Um, and a lot of those division two and division one opportunities are out of Minnesota or all of them. Um, so I think division two is a really good division for players who could be division one. Uh, they could be rock stars in division two, um, or, uh, division three players who maybe just want to be at that next level, they can play division two. Um, it's a really good sweet spot and you have great talent, great competition. Yeah. One thing, you know, and, um, Kevin, I might have you answer this as well. We haven't talked about that college, the actual like playing experience in terms of how much work it can be. Um, so, you know, would you briefly just like a, what's a standard day look like in a, in a college, college soccer? Like it, it's in, it's in the fall and we're in the middle of a season. Yeah. Good question. So I know it's, it's different for all divisions, all different schools, uh, kind of based on the resources that they do have. Um, so for everyone listening, this is a really good question to ask coaches. Um, and if you ever do a stay or meet any players, another great question to ask, um, cause you've asked the players, you're really going to get the real story. Um, but for Northern Michigan, a typical season, um, a day in the season would be waking up probably anywhere between five or 6.00 AM whenever we were scheduled for the weight room, uh, go in for a lift in the morning, um, whether it was recovery after a weekend of games um, just doing some strength and injury prevention in the morning. Then you go to classes. Um, a lot of times to, if you're a science major, um, for, like me, classes are going to start at 8 AM. Um, so, you know, you go work out, you shower, you eat, you rush to class. You got classes from eight to, um, we would usually end classes around three o'clock because we'd have practice at four or five o'clock. Um, so then you got your practice in the afternoon, um, around, you know, two hours long, hour and a half, two hours long, um, could be longer if you want to stay after and do extra stuff, um, or do some extra, um, stretching if you want to get treatment from a trainer, um, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, there's, there's days where you have film, um, usually in preparation for the weekend when you're going to be playing games, or if there's a game during the week, the day before is going to be a lot of preparation for who you're playing. So you got to get to know the team, their playing style, um, which players are going to be a threat, where, um, what their weak spots are. So all that is going to be looked at in um, a film session. And usually that would be at night. And so obviously you have a lot of studying to do with college as well. So you got to be working that studying around all of that. So during season, it's a very packed schedule. Um, and you got to be very diligent about dedicating your time um, to your studies, 
Um, you got to be blocking out time for your studies specifically um, because you, you're going to be pretty busy with film, uh, practice, lifting, uh, getting treatment. Um, I mean, all of that really. No, I, I think that's really important because um, I remember, uh, believe it or not, I was recruited Division One a little bit and uh, actually had a few conversations with coaches about the schedule. And I was like, I don't know if that's for me. <laughs> so uh, I just it's really important for everyone to know that, it, you know, all the work that goes into um, into being a college athlete, you really have to love it. No, uh, I'm, I'm okay. I had something just to uh, please. Just something that Kevin said. Uh, at, at one point, Kevin, you said um, that you your dad had driven you like all over the place to camps and stuff. Um, and I think an important part for parents and coaches is that like, or parents and players is kind of like coupling that with what I was saying earlier is like every, like when you send emails to these schools, right? Most schools are gonna, uh, especially division one, are gonna respond to you with the generic come to our camp email um and that is like the first thing they'll send to you and i just i like would ask you like ask everyone to be like conscientious about like the fact that if you're going to decide to go to id camps make it worth your while and worth your money because not only is it expensive but you're taking time out of your your life to to go all over the place to do them so you know for example like the mayak does a, a camp that puts all the, you know, takes all the coaches from the rest of the Mayak and puts them in the same place. So you're getting, you know, exposure to, ten, you know, eight different schools, to whatever, nine different schools, how many people, however many are in the Mayak at the time um, or who decide to come. Um, similarly, like a big school like Madison will bring um, local coaches to their, to their camps. Now you might not draw attention from the Madison coach, but maybe you draw attention from a local school nearby um, and that's great exposure. Now, the difficult part is when you're making a decision to go to a big school, right? Like a Duke, who's just Duke coach and 200 other players there. It's very hard to set yourself apart, especially with a very uh, limited, you know, limited roster and very high level school. That's all I wanted to add. Uh, thanks for that, Max. And while I have you here, one of the... Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, you know, one of the questions that came across that I think is best answer, answered by a player here is the academic question. So, um, you know, let's say your academics, um, you, you know, you're not in that range for getting like an academic scholarship. You know, is there situations where your athletic prowess or, you know, your soccer skills are able to help with admission to a college? Um, God, I mean, it's a hard, it's, it varies by school. So I know that at McAllister, right, which is I, not to, not to brag, um, but I think it's still top 25 small liberal arts schools in the country. Um, and so you're getting a lot of good students here. I know that there are times when if you're looking to, you know, play at a very high level school, whether it's small school, uh, D3 school or D1 school, um, there are times when the, the coach can um, help you get admitted. Now, I would kind of add to that, that when you're writing these emails, you know, and you're talking to these coaches, if you're not in a great academic standing and you feel like this is a long shot academically, but soccer wise, I'm, I'm there then be honest with these coaches, right? Like tell them up front these, these concerns you have, right? Whether it's, I don't have game film or I don't have a great ACT score. You know, these are things you can work on in the you know, process leading up to it, right? You can work on getting your ACT score up a little bit more. You can work on, you know, getting, making some film. You can work on a lot of things throughout the course of this time, but being honest with, with coaches about that, that situation you're in, um, usually leads to a better outcome for you and in, in your college search. Can I add to that, Adam? Yes, please. Um, so yeah, just like apart from just the academic side, I mean, there's there's so many scholarships that that you can apply for, and I'm sure Max could add to this as well. Um, so I wasn't going to get any athletic or any academic scholarships playing at a D3 and um, leaving high school with like a 3.25 GPA, so like nothing like excellent. So nothing I'd get an uh, academic scholarship for 
But I mean, I applied for every scholarship that UW Superior offered. So I just went to their website. I checked what kind of scholarships there or grants they were offering. And I, I just went and did the ones that, that I could possibly get money for. Um, so being a first generation college student, uh, being Hispanic, um, just, I mean, simple stuff like that. So like being a minority, um, there were scholarships that they were offering um, for those types of things. So I applied to them and and I got money off of my school. So uh, just making sure you're going and looking at your school's website, um, that you're interested in attending and filling out any scholarships that, that you could possibly get money for. Just to quickly bounce off of Jonah, um, like how random these scholarships are. I got a scholarship because my great grandfather escaped from Auschwitz. So that's yeah. a fun fact there that, I mean, who, you know, like little things like that, that you would never guess that, you know, no one would even think of, like, just because I looked around and around and around at different scholarships, I found that one. And, you know, there was obviously paper proof to prove that. And, you you know, you can get a lot of money for these random little scholarships. Really good point. Really good point. And, and it's also important to note that the, uh, you know, you can oftentimes, in a lot of situations, pair different scholarships together. Um, so it does depend on the level, but um, oftentimes if you get a little bit of money for, for this and a little bit of money for that, that's when you're getting to a point where maybe it, it's getting into that realm where it is affordable. Uh, I really wanted to thank all the players and that's, that's really going to wrap it up for the presentation portion and right around an hour and a half, which is uh, right where we wanted to be. And so I really appreciate everyone that has stuck on this whole time. And again, we are going to make this video available for, for everyone. We'll post it on our website. We'll put it out on social media so people can watch that. I do want to take an opportunity here if there are any questions uh, that people have. I know that we've tried to answer a lot of them organically through the, through the players. Um, so I'm going to kind of go back and, and look and see what sort of questions that we have and, and whether the staff or the players answer them, I might, uh, might be calling on some of you guys. The recent one that came through um, is the question for coaches and directors. Uh, so for like on-field success, are, are there local youth clubs that set up their players to be better equipped for the recruitment process? And I, I'll actually cover this one in that, um, I, I, I wouldn't, I would never go as far to say that there's one club that's better at doing this or another, but I think it's, it's really important to ask in the process. Um, and even at a younger age level, because the money that you can invest in youth soccer is nothing to sneeze at. Um, and so I think part of that agreement, and it's sort of an unspoken agreement at times, but you're, you're paying larger amounts of money at times for more time in a, on a field or in a dome, better player development. Um, you know, they possibly pay their coaches a little bit better. So hopefully the, the quality of coaches is better. And so with those resources, the trade-off is, could, you know, are you putting yourself in a position for better player development that could lead to whatever you want to do with soccer? In this case, we're talking about college soccer. Um, so ask those questions, take a, you know, ask the, the directors at the club, you know, what's your player development model and how you can help my child, um, uh, in the college recruiting process and see what they say. Um, and again, I, I just want to say, and it's not about Minneapolis city here. It's about the community, but we will open ourselves up to the community to be a resource. So to, 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 to answer questions to help guide you through the process. It's a, it's kind of a scary thing as a parent when you don't know. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we put our recruiting and sporting director, John Bisworm, his email here, but anyone that you go to our website, which is that mplscitysc.com, and you can find any of the staff and reach out. Um, and, and even if you have a question for a player, we'll, 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 we'll reach out to the player and have those questions answered for you. Can I add a little bit to your um, your answer, Adam? Please. Um, I, I think regardless of the resources at which the, the individual clubs do have once you do that homework, I still am a firm believer that a lot of the recruitment process relies on the individual player and their family. Um, not to say, not to skirt around that a club won't help you, they obviously will, but 
we talked a lot about making yourself individually stand out and the communication that's one-to-one -one from yourself to a, um, a soccer program and to a school. So I, I, I am a little bit on maybe on a different side of the fence, but I think that the more work you put in to, to make yourself stand out on your own um, and, and how hard you stick to the process of trying to explore all avenues and, and make yourself stand out, I think is, is really important. Yeah, and sorry, I'm going to jump in, not to be redundant, but I do, I agree, and, and I, I work for a local club, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased, and, and, and I won't sit here and say anything bad about anybody else, but to, to Adam's point, yeah, it, it really comes down to, I think, you can, you can kind of really quickly figure out if the club is engaged in what they're doing with that piece, and so you can, I think, to ask the questions, you know, what, what are your resources that you're doing for our players? Um, depending on how old your player is, you can ask them, you know, do you have any connections to college coaches? Because those are real things. And there are certain coaches that work with certain clubs um, or just have good relationships with them. Um, so I think it's good to, to ask the club that. And then also too, like ask them, you know, do you have any coaches that have been through this process? Um, even just on this call now, you know, Max, Stewart, Jonah, they, they both work and coach for different clubs. Um, so they're probably accessible if you ask coaching directors, you know, whatever it is to say, hey, you know, is there anybody here I could, I could talk to them about their experience? Um, and obviously, these are two great dudes that are fantastic about, you know, wanting to be helpful. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a, to John's point, though, too, it, you know, it is a lot about just, you know, what you can do. Um, clubs can be a good resource, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, hey, what, what are you guys doing a whole bunch of stuff? To help with that but you can certainly ask them and see what it is and, and you can kind of figure out pretty quickly you know are, are they going to be helpful or not so it's a really good question though so uh thanks for that matt i don't have any other questions that i can that i'm seeing adam uh, I have one say that again kevin yeah, there's one, maybe we touched on it a while back um but from jeremiah again what advice would you have given your younger younger self in preparation for making a jump from youth club or high school soccer to college. Um, did we touch on that one at all? I, I, had, I had a couple players touch on it. Um, did, is there anyone that do any of you guys have uh, any burning piece of advice for those people before, before everyone logs off? I was just going to say getting involved with NPSL teams. I'm sure they said it too. Just, NPSL, um, just playing literally at the highest level you possibly can, um, stretching it for yourself, uh, especially playing with NPSL. Like I started at Twin Stars uh, before I went to college and just playing with these older guys that are more physical um, got me ready for the physicality of college because um, you are so much younger. Um, club soccer, youth soccer is not going to be the level of physicality and athleticism going into college. Um, so you just got to get ready for, for that as well. And I think NPSL did a great job for me just preparing for the more athletic uh, dudes that are going to be playing soccer. Sure. So I think that's a great point, Kevin, in that, you know, youth, youth soccer is uh, it's, it's accessible for the most part. Um, you know, although some cost more, some cost less, but becoming a little bit more educated about what other soccer out there is in the community and, and trying to, you know, have access to that and get, in, get engaged in, in a club like that, whether it's ours or anyone else's. Um, you know, if you have an opportunity, for example, Minneapolis City, we hold at least two to three open tryouts a year. Um, and so if you're an aspiring college soccer player, I would really, I would highly suggest coming out to an open tryout for a club. And, and it's a great way to, it's a litmus test, you know, like uh, what sort of qualities do you have? And that way you have access to current players and coaching staff. And this is just speaking about our organization where you can ask questions, you know, because once you come try out for a team like ours, um, and I'll just, again, I'll just speak specifically from Minneapolis City. Once you come try out for us, you're, you're part of, you're a crow. You know, you're, you're one of us. Um, and so to, to be a member like that, to come try out, to start gaining access to a club like us, um, it's just one more thing that you can do to help prepare yourself. And like Kevin said, being a young player and playing against older adults 
um, to help uh, to help prepare yourself is huge in player development. There was a lot of one question, Adam, that we, we kind of answered the antithesis of the question. Um, it, it was around, revolving around how social media factors into modern recruiting process. Uh, we, we talked about a lot, some of the negative aspects of it, but I think there's some definite positives to it. Um, they're basically just free tools to, to, to deliver and promote yourself as a, as a person and as a player. So if, you, if you're clean on social media, you check one box, but if you're using that from a recruitment standpoint to get your, um, if you are able to put together that recruiting tape or you are able to put um, you know, anything that can market yourself up through the social channels, it, if done correctly, it definitely can be something that helps you stand out um, as opposed to some of the others. And I think that leans to what some of the coaches said um, in interviewing them for this this webinar and that don't use this time as a crutch this this time is basically all individual um, you could be out there do, shooting an iphone video or having someone shoot an iphone video of you doing some things with a ball that uh, can can get you noticed and may, maybe then that leads into a conversation it leads into you being able to send some actual game tape or getting a coach to come out and watch you play um, and that didn't cost you anything that's a great point, John. That's a, and a really great idea during this time as well. Can you, John, just a quick question. Are college coaches able to communicate with players through social media? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a really great question. I don't know what the, uh, what the parameters are around that from an NCAA perspective, but I, I, I'd have to believe that um, there are at least some periods where they can. Um, if and, you're going, if you're going into your junior year of school, I think it's after June 1st, going into your junior year of high school, they can. Okay. But they can, they, they, they can still follow you and see the content. It's Correct. just right. some point to it. Correct. I guess that's probably what you're asking, Adam. Yep. No, that's, that's great. And, you know, and, and again, that information, like the, those periods are available on NCAA website. Mm -hmm. So you can always look those up if you have questions. I got a question um, and, and I'll actually answer it because I was a goalkeeper. Um, and so it says like, as a goalkeeper, is it better to contact the head coach um, or the goalkeeper coach? Um, and, and, I, and I think John addressed a little bit of it earlier that, you know, it, it's good to reach out to one coach at a time um, and, and not kind of do the catch all. But um, if, if it was, if I was a goalkeeper, I would reach out to that goalkeeper coach first, um, you know, and then if you don't hear, if you don't hear back or, you know, you wait, a, you know, three days a week, then I, it's, I think it's okay to also reach out to the head coach. Um, but the goalkeeper coach at a lot of colleges is going to, they're the ones going to be looking at those players and evaluating and reporting back to the head coach. And oftentimes assistant coaches are doing a lot of the recruiting. So, you know, I, I think that's a really good question. And sometimes the answer depends on the school and the coaching staff, but I would always start with the, that uh, keeper specific coach first. John, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I, I think you, I think you covered it. I, I think um, whether you're, you're a position player like a goalkeeper or if you're an outfield player <clears throat> really just in general um, I would suggest don't blast every single member of a college coaching staff with the same message I, I think you can still reach out to each of them individually and maybe that's how a tactic you can use to sprinkle out some of the things we talked about like this is why I feel I'm, I'm right for the program and you can send that to an assistant coach you could send, um, you know, something more uh, academic related um, or program specific to the to the head coach. But don't don't go through the list of just because they have their email addresses online and just start peppering them and copying and pasting. It's it's probably not going to get you as far as you might think it would. Yeah, I, I mean, we can speak as a staff where if we all get BCC'd on an email and we all all get the same email and we talk about the players that are sending us and, you know, we'll, we'll get together. And if it's a copied and pasted email um, to send to the whole staff that tells us that maybe the interest isn't all that high, that they couldn't take that two minutes to, to kind of do, to put a personalized touch. So 
Mm -hmm. I think without, you know, I'll, I'll just open it up and say if anyone else has any other questions, feel free. We're an open book. Um, otherwise, unless any questions come here in the next 15 seconds, um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for spending some time with us this evening. Like I said, this is part one. Um, we're hoping to do some more webinars in the future on various other topics. We'll have different speakers. We'll always feature players because we've got a fantastic group of guys. Um, and, and please check us out at www.mplscitysc.com. Um, or you can follow us on social media at the, using a lot of the same, uh, that same moniker. Um, and, uh, and certainly, once we get back to playing soccer, come check out a game. Um, obviously, we're doing this because none of us know when soccer will be coming back. Um, and, but you can bet as soon as we can, uh, we'll be out there. So uh, stay in contact through social media, through our website. Uh, reach out, send John an email. You can see his email there in pink. Um, and then we really hope to kind of see you out there at, uh, at Augsburg at, at a game. Thanks, guys. You just got hoofed. <laughs> oh, he had to do it. Can we uh, stick on?